are in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23, um, and we talked a good bit about, you know, the, some of the themes that we have in Deuteronomy, some of the concepts that are there, is that he starts off the book of Deuteronomy, you know, it's, uh, it's those, those last messages of Moses before he dies, before it's passed on to Joshua, before he uh, goes into the promised land, and so he's giving them a series of messages. And he, he does certain things. He reminds them of certain things. He reminds them of who God is and what he has done. And he does that in order to prepare them, in order to help them be ready for what's coming in the days ahead. And then they go in and establish the kingdom. You know, they're going to have all these kinds of obstacles. They're going to have all these kinds of difficulties and problems. But if they remember who God is and they remember how he has worked in the past, they will trust him and they will believe him for what is coming. And one of the big issues in this kingdom, when you, when they are in the land, when they are trying to establish, you know, this what they are establishing there as the land of Israel, as the occupying of this land, it is a picture and a foreshadowing of what the kingdom of Messiah is supposed to be, about that future kingdom that is coming. And he is supposed to give us a glimpse of what that is supposed to be. And, of course, one of the things that he, he emphasizes greatly in the, the, the previous Torah portions was, uh, was that of justice. And, and that's not an issue that we're dealing with anymore in this country right now. We've got everything settled. And justice, we've got, everybody's got that perfectly figured out, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's talking about that at all. So that was one of the big issues that is going to come up, you know, in the life of the people of Israel in the land. So much so that he says in back in chapter 16, he says, justice, justice, you must pursue so that you may live and possess the land that Adonai, your God, is giving you. That's Deuteronomy 16, 20. And all kidding aside, justice, you know, we, justice can be a difficult concept and we're seeing that. In our nation, we're seeing that it's a difficult concept to pursue, to be in agreement upon, to grab hold, because situations are constantly coming up that challenge maybe the way we've always done things, challenge the rightness of a situation. You know, where uh, uh, the law in question doesn't specifically address the situation at hand. You know, what do we do? How do we handle that? You know, in our country, we have a, a government structure that can make a new law to address a new situation. We have courts with judges that can decide cases, and that's one of the things that we looked at last week that they were setting up, these, these judges and things to establish matters. And thankfully, the Torah does provide that kind of mechanism for how to deal with situations that are not specifically commanded. This is back in the previous portion, Exodus 18, 20. He says, enlighten them as to the statutes, <coughs> And the laws, and show them the way by which they must walk and the work that they must, must do. But you should seek out capable men of all the people, men who fear God, men, who, uh, men of truth, who hate bribery, and appoint them to be rulers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. It says, let them judge the people all the time. Then let every major case be brought to you. But every minor case they can judge for themselves. Make it easier for yourself as they bear the burden with you. This is part of that discussion with Jethro and Moses and trying to extend the burden, you know, to put it off to where justice can, can be maintained. This is a mechanism set up to, to govern, to address the interaction between members of the community, members of what will be this kingdom. You know, first we have the, the Torah, the law. It has to be taught and known to everybody. You know, that's the goal. He wants everybody to know these statutes and these laws. That's one of the benefits of having a, a, a what well, you hear in modern terms, a smaller government concept. You know, a, a, having a relatively small or simple law code because everybody can learn the basics. How many of you have learned all the laws in this country? Anybody? You know, I, I looked up a couple things. It says there's, when federal laws were first codified in 1927, this is just federal, 
okay? They all fit into a single volume. By the 1980s, there were 50 volumes with over 23,000 pages. Okay, the, the Internal Revenue Code, the IRS type of code, first codified in 1874, now contains more than 3.4 million words. And if they were printed with 60 lines to a page, it said it'd be 7,500 pages long. So there are about 20,000 laws just governed, and think about this, there are 20,000 laws just governing the use and ownership of guns, Second Amendment stuff, and so new laws means new crime. You know, from the start of 2000 to 2007, Congress created at least 452 new crimes. So that at the time, the total number of federal, federal crimes exceeded 4,450. That's just federal. And so it's one of those things that, um, do you know them all? No. And in fact, if they wanted to, you know, they could they could just watch you for about 30 or 40 minutes and they could probably find something that you do to pick you up. But you know, you, then you add to that state and local, and it's impossible because it's so massive, because it's so big, it's impossible for us to know them all. And what's legal in one place might not might be illegal in another. That's been coming up in the news in just the last couple of days. But knowing the basics helps you navigate. You know, every person learns the basic rules of the road before they're given a driver's license, I hope, right? You learn the basics? What side of the road do you drive on? The right, right side, right? That's here in Tennessee. What about if you go to Texas or New York? Is it the same? Yes, it is. What if you go to England or Australia or some other place? It's not. But do you have to know every single traffic law before you visit Texas? No, you don't have to. Can that get you in trouble? Yeah, it can. You know, you have to know what speed limits things and those concepts are and how they enforce those types of things. This is a joke that I remember seeing uh, a number of years ago. And let me see if we can get some response from you here. What does S-H-O-P spell? Say it out for me. Shop. Shop. What does C-R-O-P spell? Crop. Crop. What, what do you do? Uh, what does D-R-O-P spell? Y'all aren't helping me out here. Drop. What do you do when you get to a green light? I mean, go. Oh, uh, uh. <laughs> Somebody got it back there. Yeah, so, so sometimes we can get so used to a, a way things happen, a way things proceed, that you can miss Something simple, something basic. What do you do when you get to a green light? You keep going, right? So here we are. This is what they were supposed to do. When they had all of these, they were taught all of these statutes and laws to show them how they must live, how many must walk, what they must do. But you're still going to have issues that come up. Um, and they're supposed to address those kind of things that maybe not specifically commanded. Numbers chapter 11, this was said, Adonai said to Moses, Bring me seven of the, 70 of the elders of Israel whom you know to be elders of the people and their leaders. Take them to the tent of meeting so they may stand with you there. Then I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take some of the, the ruach, some of the spirit that is on you, and will place it on them, and they will carry with you the burden of the people so you will not be carrying it alone. Okay, again, it's, it's setting up this system. Deuteronomy 17, he says, Suppose a matter arises that is too hard for you to judge over bloodshed, legal claims, or assaults, matters of controversy within your gates. Then you should go up to the place that Adonai your God chooses. Right? What is that place? Do they have, it's not yet, but what does that place become? That place is eventually becomes Jerusalem. Okay? Um, go up there to the place... Adonai your God chooses and come to the Levitical Kohanim, the priest, and the judge in charge at that time, and you will inquire. Inquire of who? Just of them? Or are you inquiring of God? Okay. And they will tell you the sentence of judgment. He says, 
Then it says this, you are to act according to the sentence they tell you from that place Adonai chooses, and take care to do all that they instruct you. You are to act according to the instruction they teach you and the judgment they tell you. You must not turn aside from the sentence they tell you to the right or to the left. So were these judgments supposed to be binding? Yeah, they are supposed to be followed. So specific cases were supposed to move up. You know, all those different people they had, the, the leaders over tens, hundreds, thousands, things like that. Those specific issues or difficult cases would move up a lot like our court system. Our court system is arranged a lot like this, where you have a smaller or a local court can get appealed to a higher court, a district court, or a state court, a regional court, or a federal court, all the way up to what we call the Supreme Court. All right? And as they move up, you know, when it gets to the Supreme Court, there is no higher court to decide. So that's what we consider these days the settling issue. All right? But eventually, if, a, if an issue was too difficult for them to decide on these lower levels, they would go to the, the priest, they'd be brought before Adonai, he would give his instruction, he would give his ruling or his Torah on a matter. And this is the basis of what became elements of what's called the oral Torah. Decisions and case law that applied the commands and laws into specific situations. And as this passage says, these were supposed to be binding. Since they were brought before the Lord, they were really statements from him at that point. <coughs> And this shows up, we see this show up later in the prophets in, Deuter in Jeremiah, chapter 17. It says, Thus says Adonai, Guard your souls. He says, Carry no burden on the day of Shabbat, or bring it in through the gates of Jerusalem. Nor should you carry a burden out of your houses on Yom Shabbat, or do any work, but keep Yom Shabbat holy as I commanded your fathers. Yet they did not listen or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck, not hearing or accepting correction. Okay? And what's interesting here, when you look at some of these words, the word uh, for work is this word melacha, which deputyship or ministry. Uh, it's, it's like your employment, your work, business, or occupation. It's the things that can be made or used, the things that you have constructed or built. It's your, it's your workmanship. Okay? Uh, it's your, it could be your manner of work. It could be the idea of service, the things that you serve or give even toward God. Now, what's interesting about this word, melecha, is the root of that word is the word malach. So you see those numbers change. 4399, 4397. Uh, which means to dispatch as a deputy or messenger. Anybody guess what this is usually translated as? Agent. It's angel. Right? That's usually how we translate this word that is related to the word work. Uh, it's work or angel, representative, ambassador. It's not, it's not too far off where we get the word king, which is melech, which is 4428. And that's a, I think that's a very interesting connection. Um, this burden is, is the burden that he's talking about carrying out of the house. Sorry, that's what this word was, is burden. I didn't have that in there. But uh, it's clearly connected to someone's work. And why, But I was asking, why is the word for work, melacha, so closely related to the word messenger, angel, angel malach? which is in turn close to the word king, Melech. And when you think about it, think about it like this. When you meet somebody for the first time, and hopefully we'll have a chance to do that in a little while, uh, when you meet somebody for the first time, what's one of the first questions that you ask? What do you do for a living, right? What's your, what, what's your job, besides what's your name? I said one of, not the only question. Uh, it's one of the first questions that we ask is, what do you do for a living? What does that do? What does that tell us? Does that tell us something about them? Right? Your work, what you do, says something about who you are, what kind of person you are, 
how you make your living. It, it may even, in some circles, it indicates social status, you know, where you are you know, on that ladder of, of life, for good or for bad, right? So what you do, what you do as your work sends a message about you. You, you, your work also, typically, as, as a scripture, the biblical calendar, how many days does the, your work supposed to rule your life, to be king over your life? Six days, right? Your work is essentially your ruler of what you do, where you go, how you spend your time. And for some, their work is their king. Because they're always ruled by it. Work comes before everything else. Work comes before friends, before family, before rest, even before God. Some people live that way. They don't take six days and one day off. They, they work all the time. And so that's why your work, what you do, Malacha, sends a message about who your king is. And so if you are still doing work, on the day that your king or your God told you not to work, who's really your king? Your work is, or yourself is. Okay. So when you look at that passage, guard your souls, carry no burden on the day of Shabbat, or bring it into the gates of Jerusalem, nor should you carry this burden out of your houses on Yom Shabbat, or do any work. That's that connection with these things. Yet, Yes, there is a command about not doing work on the Sabbath, even not gathering firewood, if you remember that passage out of Exodus and others. But is there, is there one about not carrying anything, anything out of your house? Is there one specific command about not carrying anything through the city gates? There's not really a specific one saying those types of things, at least not to my knowledge. And besides, when this was said, you can't bring anything through the gates of Jerusalem. They didn't even possess Jerusalem during Moses' lifetime. So is this just referring to Jerusalem? Is this referring to every city? But ask the question, who is speaking in this passage? Adonai is. The Lord is. He's the one who is speaking. So this is not just Jeremiah giving his opinion. This is not just Jeremiah making stuff up. But so a key question that we need to ask is, when did Adonai give this instruction about carrying this burden or bringing it through the gates of Jerusalem? Because Jeremiah is writing just before the exile. He saw, he witnessed Jerusalem fall in 586 B.C. All right? You get the answer down here. Don't do any work, but king, keep Yom Shabbat holy as I commanded your fathers. As I commanded your fathers, your ancestors, those who came before you. Now, is he, is he talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Maybe you can see the first part, maybe with the carrying stuff out of the, their houses, their tents. But you know, they didn't really have any cities at the time. They didn't have Jerusalem. It could possibly be, even likely be Moses. And this is one of the important things to realize is that several scriptures and the commands that are given, especially here in Deuteronomy, are given in the future tense. Deuteronomy 19.1 puts it like this. He says, When Adonai your God cuts off the nations whose land Adonai your God is giving you, and you dispossess them and dwell in their cities, and houses. Okay? So this is talking about things that haven't quite happened yet, but they will be happening in the near future. They are going to go into the land, and they are going to possess those cities and those houses. God knows that they're going to need some kind of command to regulate how these things function and they operate. But it can also be through this mechanism of the cases brought to the priests, brought before the Lord, even after Moses, even when they had captured Jerusalem, when Jerusalem was designated as that place that Adonai your God chooses to make his name.
they dwell. That's Deuteronomy 16, 11. This passage here in, in Jeremiah that we were just looking at, Adonai, he speaks with an absolute authority that this is a command that I gave to your forefathers. This is one that I gave in the past. But somehow, even a command like this is not always absolutely understood, it's not always absolutely recognized or practiced, because the issue comes up over and over and over again. How is do we keep the Shabbat? How is this practiced and put into daily life? It even happened again after the exile in the book of Nehemiah, one of the other prophets. This is after they've come back and after they have begun to rebuild the walls. He says, in those days I saw in Judah some people treading wine presses on the Shabbat, some bringing and loading heaps of grain on donkeys as well as wine, grapes, figs, and various other burdens, bringing them into Jerusalem on the Shabbat day. So I warned them about selling food on that day. Verse 16 says, Men from Tyre who lived there were bringing fish and all kinds of merchandise and were selling it on the Yom Shabbat, the day of the Sabbath, to the children of Judah, even in where? Jerusalem. So they were, and Jeremiah's writings were known to Nehemiah. Daniel knows Jeremiah's writings when he's over in exile in Babylon. So what kind of message were the people of Israel sending in continuing to work, continuing to go about life as normal on the Shabbat? Treating it as just any other day to go to the market. Continuing to carry their merchandise through the gates of Jerusalem to sell them. Making their animals work. What's that? Making even their animals work. If you're right. In their work, in continuing to do these kinds of things, they were sending the message that God is not their king. Because their king told them not to do this. And in so doing, they were breaking the commandment about the Shabbat, the Sabbath, bringing different kind of, a different kind of law, a different system of justice, a different king into Jerusalem, where his name is supposed to dwell. That's the message. That's why those two words are connected. That your work and the messenger are so closely related. This should have been a settled issue but it, by then, but it was not. And even in, Jerusalem, in Yeshua's day, not everything was completely settled. Right? What did Yeshua have to do when he went into the temple for one of the first times he went into the temple. What did he have to do to those that were buying and selling and trading out money? He had to clean, clean, it, out. Had to clean it out. He had to throw people out. Others had said, hey, this is fine. You can do this. But he had to kick them out and say, you will not turn my father's house into a marketplace. My, house is, my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer for who? All the nations. Right? So this was not even settled and fully practiced in Yeshua's day. You had competing teachers. You had competing rabbis trying to be counted in that kind of authority, in that oral Torah kind of authority, and have their judgments recognized and followed, much like you have you know, lawyers today. Many of them have a dream of going in and arguing a case before the Supreme Court and winning, of course. You never, you never vision yourself going to the Supreme Court and losing. You always vision going to for the Supreme Court and winning, and you want to win a case that sets precedent for everything that comes after you. So these rabbis had the same kind of attitude. They wanted their rulings, their judgments, to, to be counted with that kind of authority. So some things are still being debated, particularly around the, the Sabbath. You know, there were new situations, new questions that would come forward for consideration. And much of that became a, a burden and a tool of enforcement and control. Right? Do we know anything about that kind of situation today? Of enforcement and control. How are we seated? 
How are you seated today? We're sitting there. You're sitting in an example of that kind of yes. stuff. Okay? That's one reason why we left them up like this and didn't put them back like normal. Because things can quickly become a burden and you look at them and you're like, why in the world are we doing that? Well, somebody, some expert, some so-and-so said, we need to do this, and so that's why we do this. Here we are. And we may look at it and say, this is silly, but we still do it. There we are. But even in the early Messianic community, the followers of Yeshua, they were debating, they were trying to figure things out. And there were times that even uh, Paul referred to it, Romans chapter 14. He says, welcome anyone who is weak in faith, but don't argue about disputed matters. That's the Christian Standard Bible. The, the uh, complete Jewish Bible says, now for, as for a person whose trust is weak, welcome him, but not to get into an argument over opinions. Okay? This is an important matter. Are there things still in dispute, still things that we're trying to figure out? Yeah. We don't know everything. We don't do everything right. And when this is talking about weakness, this is more, the, the word is related to the idea of being sick or lacking that strength, being feeble. You know, it's someone, and you know, James talks about this, Paul talks about this in the sense of someone who is blown and tossed by the wind, someone who is susceptible to fine-sounding arguments, someone who lacks uh, discernment, not having a solid foundation of faith by which to judge a matter, possibly even a new believer. In other words, this is a, uh, someone whose faith is weak is in a lot of ways talking about someone who's lacking in spiritual maturity. But when they come, are you supposed to throw them out and say, I'm not wasting my time with you? Is that what it says? No. Even when there's disputes, even when there's disagreements, do you break fellowship? No. You don't do that. You welcome them. You don't ridicule, you don't make them feel unwelcome, you don't argue with them to the point of division, but you trust that a mature faith, uh, a sound teaching, a solid foundation over time will influence. In other words, and this is sometimes a hard thing for me to learn, and it's a hard thing that you see going on in the world today, especially in the internet and the comments and things like that. Um, you don't have to win every argument, right? You don't have to fight every fight, every comment, everything that somebody says. You don't have to stick your nose in on it. We don't have to fight on, on the first day or the first time you meet. You don't have to settle things. Otherwise, everything is going to be driven by accusation. It's going to be driven by resentment. It's going to be driven by superiority. And you, what you won't have is fellowship. You don't just divide over everything, but maintaining fellowship is important. You keep the things that you have in common at the forefront. You fix your eyes on Yeshua and his kingdom. And Yeshua, he dealt with this frequently, especially on issues of Shabbat. You know, one example is in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We see it in, in Luke chapter 6. It says, Now during Shabbat, Yeshua was passing through grain fields, and his disciples were picking and eating heads of grain and rubbing them in their hands. Okay, and, But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not permitted on Shabbat? And Luke says it like this. He says, why are you doing it? They're saying that to Yeshua. Right? But the scripture says his disciples were picking, but they're saying it to him. Some of the other, you know, Matthew also says, why are your disciples doing this? So the accusation is is this, because the rabbi, the teacher, is essentially responsible for the actions of his disciples. And if they are doing something, it must be because their teacher said that they could, or he allowed them to, or he didn't stop them from doing it, he didn't rebuke them from doing it. 
So the question is, why are you doing, even though this says your disciples are doing it, he, the, the Pharisees are accusing Yeshua of doing it. And that's why. This group of Pharisees were trying to tear Yeshua down in order to elevate themselves. They wanted to start an argument over, is this a settled matter or is this a disputed matter? This will be a more of a disputed matter about what they are doing. This was their purpose even in traveling with him. They were trying to find a reason to tear him down. What is not permitted on Shabbat? That was the dispute. Something that would be allowed every other day, but not on the Sabbath. Notice what day it is is not in dispute. We sometimes have those arguments going around today. It's agreed that this day was a Sabbath, and I've always thought that this was a bit unusual in reading this kind of passage in our culture because there are several things that, when you look at it from today's culture, that we could potentially accuse them of. <coughs> what else could Yeshua be accused of in this? Trespassing. Trespassing is a big one. You know, they're walking through somebody else's field. How do you feel when somebody starts walking through your property? Anybody just say, okay, that's fine. That's cool. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> it it, it <laughs> usually makes us nervous. What are you doing here? You don't have permission to be on my property, right? So trespassing is one of them. You know, one of the issues that they had in their day was a matter of distance. You know, how far are you allowed to travel on Shabbat? Is that the issue here? But they are out in the fields. They're not in town. They're not in a home. You know, we don't know where they're going. We don't know where they're coming from. But they didn't accuse or question him of that. They didn't, they didn't accuse him of trespassing on this field. No idea whether he had permission to be there or not. What about stealing? Could they accuse him of that? You could make a case. You could accuse. Because what are they doing? They're going through somebody else's grain fields. And... They're picking and eating their crop. How, would, if it, how many of y'all have a garden? Anybody have a garden? How would you feel if somebody started walking through your yard, your lawn, your property, and started picking stuff out of your garden? They stay in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> but again, those are some things that could be a problem, especially in our culture today. Well, those aren't things that are disputed as much as you might think at least for this culture. And it's actually in this Torah portion provides some instruction, some Torah from God. You might have been wondering, when am I going to get to this portion? This is, this is the passage. It's Deuteronomy 23, 25. He says, When you come into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes, but you are not to put any in your basket. This is not about Shabbat. This is about those other issues. 26 says, when you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you are not to swing a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. So traveling through was different in that day. They, there weren't electric fences. There weren't no trespassing signs. Passing through was allowed. And they could pass through and even pick up something that they need you know, that idea of uh, food, that idea of nourishment. They could do some of those things, but even then, there were limits. The one passing through had responsibilities. You could not take advantage of someone's compassion. You could not take advantage of someone else's allowance. These travelers, they could eat a few grapes, but they could not do what? They couldn't come, they couldn't come prepared with a truck and haul out the grapes. Right? They could grab a few heads of grain, but you couldn't have a harvester come in and cut it down and take it with you. You can't harvest what does not belong to you. There are other allowances. The gleanings of the field, as you mentioned. Right? People in need should not be denied. Compassion should motivate the owner of the field, but at the same time, 
those in need should not abuse that compassion or provision. I mean, imagine, if you, this is the rule. It's like, well, you know, all I have to do is walk back and forth between that guy and that guy's field about 50 times, and I can get enough grain collected to probably sell something. Are there people who would do that out there? Yes, sadly there are. Okay? Both sides have responsibilities. Both sides have expectations. The owner of the field cannot be uncompassionate and not allow any passage, nor allow any kind of this gleaning. But the traveler through the field should also respect the owner of the field and not take advantage of that generosity. And so Yeshua and his disciples could not be accused of doing wrong on this point because Torah provides a clear statement and a command. Instead, they brought up the Shabbat, making it more about what you can't do on Shabbat. And again, that's a problem that we a lot of people still talk about. What can you do or what can you not do? And that's what we make it about. We make it more about what you can't do rather than the blessing of what you can. You know, we can easily and often do turn what God is intended to be a blessing, which is a, a source of peace and rest, into something that is a burden. But what are we not supposed to carry on Shabbat? We're not supposed to carry burdens. We can put our burdens down. We don't have to be ruled by work. We don't have to be ruled by our occupation. But we can trust in the provision of our king. Because ultimately, whose field are we walking through? We're walking through his field. The whole earth is his. We are walking in daily life through his field. And, and he, has, he will provide for us along the way. This is the king's provision. Every other day we may be tempted to believe that it's all on us. But Shabbat reminds us that he is our king, our provider, and the source of our strength. And we see it send a message. We send a message by refraining from work. We send a message about who our king truly is. But that doesn't mean that we have nothing to do. Is compassion, generosity, hospitality, is that uh, meeting, does that need, meeting needs, does that, uh, does that honor God on Shabbat? Yes, it does. See, honoring God never takes a day off. Compassion never takes a day off. That was the heart of Yeshua's answer to the charge. Why are your disciples, why are you breaking the Shabbat? Then answering them, Yeshua said, Haven't you read what David did when he was hungry and those with him? He was having to flee. He was having to leave in a hurry. He couldn't take provisions because his life was in danger. How he entered into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, which only the Kohanim, only the priests, are permitted to eat, and even gave it to those with him. said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Shabbat. He's referring to something from 1 Samuel chapter 21. Again, when David is fleeing from Saul, and they were running for their life, so to speak. They didn't have the supplies that they needed. So the need and compassion allowed something that normally was not allowed. Matthew adds these statements in chapter 12 in the parallel passage. Haven't you read in the Torah that on the Shabbat, the Kohanim in the temple break the Shabbat and yet are innocent? How do, how do the, the priests in the temple break Shabbat? Are they just sitting around, lounging around, doing nothing in the temple all day? No. Are they working? Is it hard work? Yes. This might be the busiest and hard, most hard-working day that they have in the week. But what are they doing? They're serving, they're ministering, they're working not for their own kingdom, but whose kingdom? They're working for God's kingdom. They are innocent, even though they're working hard. 
They're working hard, and yet they are innocent. He says, but I tell you, this is Yeshua talking, that something greater than the temple is here. And he says, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you wouldn't have condemned the innocent. He is making a, a ruling here. Who is he calling the innocent? His disciples. You're accusing them of breaking the Shabbat. I'm saying they are innocent. Because of these principles. Mercy. Compassion. And then he says it again. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Shabbat. Uh, but he goes on. Leaving from there, he went into their synagogue. And he's giving a practical example. Another example of what this looks like. Of what justice in the kingdom of God looks like. A man of the withered hand was there, and so that they might accuse him, they questioned Yeshua, saying, Is it permitted to heal on the Shabbat? They're bringing up a disputed or a debated matter of the day. Is it permitted to heal on the Shabbat? And he said to them, he's giving an announcement, a ruling, What man among you will not grab his sheep and lift it out if it falls into a pit on Shabbat? And all the more probably like, well, we would all do that. Why? I mean, he's saying, you show compassion to an animal, and that's okay. How much more valuable, then, is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is permitted to do good on Shabbat. Good defined by who? By him. And what is what work or what you do, the things that you do for him and his kingdom. It is permitted to do what is good on the Shabbat. And he said to the man, they want to bring you up as an example of what not to do. They want to try to trap me in those just situations. I'm going to use it as a moment of blessing. He said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out and was restored as healthy as the other. They never expected him to do that. They never, they expected that man to be there next week, next Shabbat, with the same ailment, with the same injury. Yeshua shows them a glimpse of the kingdom. See, this permitting to do good on Shabbat, that should never be in dispute. That should never be up for debate, but even that was. And justice had been or was denied. Yeshua was restoring the two true meaning, practice, and purpose for the Shabbat, which is what the Messiah is supposed to do. He was giving a glimpse of the kingdom that will be ruled by the Son of Man, who is Lord of the Shabbat. He shows that Shabbat is also supposed to be just. He shows that the king is the one who says what does or does not break it. God's justice prevails in the kingdom of God. A restoration is the heart of what he is hoping to do in the kingdom. Hope and expectation should be our goal on the Sabbath. That's what we should be living for. That's what sh the message that Shabbat should be sending to us, is hope and restoration. Even for those who have been injured, even for those who have been rejected, even those who are distant from God and feel like they have nothing to do with him or his people, like those who have been denied access to even the temple that we read about in, uh, in Deuteronomy 23, also in this portion, where it talks about the eunuchs, those who have been injured. There was a law. That says that they cannot enter the community of Adonai. No one born of, of all of these things can enter the community of Adonai. They were not able to fully participate in the life of the temple. Not able to fully participate in worship. But again, we see this played out. In the life of the early Messianic community. In the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. He would have been coming all of that way, 
would have come to Jerusalem, come to the temple, and been denied and say, you cannot come in. He would have been sent home without fully being able to participate in worship. And he asks, you can see that that's what happens, because he asks a revealing question in Acts chapter 8, verse 36. He says, now, as this is after he'd been talking with Philip for a little while. He wanted to put his faith in the Messiah. He says, as they were going down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What's to prevent me from being immersed? What's to prevent me from being baptized? Is there anything preventing me from being baptized? Why would he ask that question? Because he had been prevented in Jerusalem, in the temple, because he was the eunuch. He was not allowed to do those things. He was not allowed to participate fully and completely in the worship at the temple. And so he's saying, look, you're telling me this great stuff, and yes, I would love to be a part of it, but is there anything stopping me? Y'all have your scriptures. Look at that. I don't have the passage here. No, no. Uh, Acts chapter 8. Oh, Acts chapter 8. Here's water. Is there anything preventing me from being baptized? And so then Philip, he orders the chariot to stop. They both go down to the water. Philip and the eunuch, and, the, and Philip baptized him, immersed him. When they came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Adonai, snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw no more of him, for he went on his way rejoicing. Okay, was there anything preventing him? No. See, in this world, there was something that prevented him from going to the temple. But Messiah and his kingdom will have things restored. Even a broken and an injured man. And that message, that good news, came out of Isaiah 53, which we were reading earlier. Where Philip tells the man about Messiah and his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sin. But just a couple of chapters later, you know, a scroll, it's not, it's not even like you're turning the page. You're just keeping moving just a little bit further to get to Isaiah 56. Philip could also reveal the hope of the kingdom even to somebody like this Ethiopian eunuch. Isaiah 56 just a couple of rolls of the scroll from where he started. It says, Do not let the son of a foreigner who has joined himself to Adonai say, Adonai will surely exclude me, will prevent me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says Adonai to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, my Shabbat hope, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. See, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch in, in Acts could have been doing all of that and still been denied. But this is a picture of the kingdom and the restoration and the hope that is to come. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose what is pleasing me, pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant, I will give to them where? In my house. And that's the language of what? That's referring to his house is the temple. I will give to them in my house and within my walls. So are they going to get in? Are they going to be allowed to participate? Allowed in? Yes. I will give them a memorial and a name better than sons or daughters. Because the unit can't have those anymore. I will give them an everlasting name that will not ever, will not be cut off. He says also, you can see this down here, also the foreigners who join themselves to Adonai to minister to him and to love the name of Adonai and to be his servants, all who keep from profaning the Sabbath and who hold fast to my covenant. He says, these I will bring to my holy mountain and let them rejoice. Where? In my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings, their sacrifices will be acceptable. They weren't acceptable to the Ethiopian eunuch. He was not allowed to do those things. 
They will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. That is what the kingdom is going to be like. That is what true justice is that this world is so desperately trying to find and seek and pursue but cannot grab hold of. This is what it's going to look like. This is the hope that is supposed to be there in the hearts of God's people for the coming of Messiah, for the coming of the King. That's what we have to look forward to. That's what Shabbat, that's what Sabbath is supposed to teach us. Every day, every Shabbat is supposed to keep in mind the future for what he has for us, that Sabbath rest that is to come as Hebrews talks about. That's what Sabbath is for. And it's a glorious future, isn't it? Are we ready for that? Are we looking forward to that? 